Walt Disney Company has been around for a long time. In fact, this year they're celebrating their 100th anniversary. And while we all know them for the magic and the wonder and all that stuff, things haven't always been that magical. Another big cultural event happening at the time of this recording is the writers and actors strikes going on in the entertainment industry. And Disney plays a big part in the outcome of this strike, like determining how writers and actors get paid. So as a parallel to these current events, let's take a look back all the way to 1941 when Walt Disney's animators went on strike. <laughs> By the 1930s, Disney had already become the most influential animation studio in history, showcasing beautiful animation in their shorts like Silly Symphony. But in 1937, the studio released Snow White, the first feature-length animated film. It was a monumental achievement in the world of animation, with more than 1,500 artists and production staff needed to complete it. One year later, in 1938, the Screen Cartoonist Guild was formed, mainly as a result of protests at other studios, not Disney. Labor unions were nothing new, as many were founded in the aftermath of the Great Depression. Our aim must be to achieve and maintain a national economy whose factors are so finely balanced that the worker is always sure of a job which will guarantee a living wage. But back to Disney. The success of Snow White was huge and enabled the Walt Disney Company to expand and build a brand new state-of-the-art production studio in Burbank, California. But despite this growth, the company started getting skimpy on things like compensation and benefits. The studio put into practice a hierarchy system with a very disorganized pay structure. Some animators would make as much as $300 a week, while other employees would earn as little as 12. According to then Disney animator Willis Pyle, there was no rhyme or reason as to the way the guys were paid. You might be sitting next to a guy doing the same thing as you, and you might be getting $20 a week more or less than him. Employees were also forced to work longer hours, but wouldn't be compensated properly for all those extra hours. By 1941, animators had become dissatisfied with these work conditions and began joining the Screen Cartoonist Guild in secret. One of these animators was Art Babbitt, who was actually a high-ranking animator with great pay, but he was sick and tired of seeing the treatment that the majority of animators were receiving. Eventually, Babbitt, among others, approached Walt Disney and demanded he unionize the studio, but Disney flat-out refused. Speaking directly to his employees, Disney had this to say about the idea of unionizing the studio. My first recommendation to the lot of you is this. Put your own house in order. You can't accomplish a damn thing by sitting around and waiting to be told everything. If you're not progressing as you should, instead of grumbling and growling, do something about it. And they did do something about it. Right after that speech, over 200 Disney employees went on strike. Many of the animators were abruptly fired by Disney for their participation in the strike. The scene in front of the studio has been described as carnival-esque. Animators would use humor and their artistic skill in making their picket signs. They would also carry around a mock guillotine to behead a Walt Disney mannequin. Disney would retaliate by making caricatures of those employees, portraying them as the circus clowns seen in Dumbo. Let's go tell the boss! Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, let's hit him for a race! Yeah, sure! This is Roy Creel, dog! Oh, we're gonna hit the big boss for a race! Yes, we're gonna hit the big boss for a race! The strike went on like that for months, and it ended when the U.S. government got involved. You see, around this time, Disney was producing pro-American propaganda cartoons during World War II. This led to his goodwill tour in Latin America, but his troubles back home began to follow him there. With some behind-the-scenes maneuvering done by the Guild's business agent Bill Pomerantz, the State Department had gotten word that protests were being planned in Latin America. If Walt was to be a goodwill ambassador, the State Department needed his public image to be positive. So the government's Labor Conciliation Service worked to bring both parties together in Washington, D.C., basically forced them to find middle ground. An agreement was made, officially ending the strike after a total of three months and 26 days. The agreement allowed for the reinstatement of fired employees, a more equal pay structure, as well as health insurance benefits, pensions, and even screen credits for all the animators. The strike changed Walt Disney's relationship with his animators, obviously. He would later testify in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, claiming that communism was to blame for the strike. The thing that 
that I resent the most is that they are able to get into these unions and take them over and represent to the world that a group of people that are in my plant that I know are good 100% Americans uh, have, are trapped by this group and they're represented to the world as supporting all of those ideologies and it's not so. And I feel that, uh, that they really ought to be smoked out and shown up for what they are so that all the good free causes in this country, all the liberalisms that really are American can go out without this taint of communism. And you can see this as a turning point for Disney. While the studio continued to produce animated films, Walt's interest in the medium began to fade. And he would eventually find other areas to focus his attention, like with adopting the new medium of television in the 1950s, as well as building Disneyland and eventually Disney World. As for the animators, many of them ended up moving to different studios, even the ones that were invited back after being fired. Disney saw this as a good thing later on writing that the strike cleaned house at our studio and got rid of the chip on the shoulder boys and the world owes me a living lads. While it got very heated and very personal, it was still a necessary thing to happen for the industry to establish a more organized pay structure and proper benefits. It wasn't the first strike to happen in the entertainment industry and it definitely wasn't the last. As we can see with current events, the times are always changing and you can almost guarantee that working conditions are gonna change with them. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I know I've been gone for a long time on this channel. It's been over three years since my last video, and my last video was just another video of me saying it had been a long time since I uploaded, so I think it's really been like four or five years since my last real video. And that's crazy, I know. But what's even crazier is that people still continue to watch those old videos. And it inspired me a little bit, yes, to get back into it and to really give this another shot. And as you might have noticed, I have changed the name of the channel from NB Studios to Media Moocher. And the reason for that is not that exciting. I, I, just, I never really liked the name NB Studios. Plus, if you go on YouTube and you look up NB Studios, you're gonna see like 10 other channels with that exact same name. So I just decided to change it. But anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. I've got another video in the works now, and I've got some ideas for other videos that I'm doing. But if you've got any ideas for video topics or something you'd like to hear me talk about, feel free to comment them below. Also, make sure you like and subscribe and all that stuff. I appreciate it. Thanks again for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time.